about the National Artist Award. So uh, you have uh, the National Artist Prize in the field of culture, and this is awarded every three years in the fields of music, dance, theater, visual arts, literature, uh, film and broadcast arts, and architecture and the allied arts. So a national artist is a Filipino citizen who has been given the rank and title of national artist in recognition of his or her significant contributions to the development of Philippine arts and letters. And this award is jointly administered by the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, NCCA, and the Cultural Center of the Philippines, CCP. And this is conferred by no less than the President of the Philippines upon the recommendation of both institutions. Now, as one of the honors of the Philippines, it embodies the nation's highest ideals in humanism and aesthetic expression through the distinct achievements of individual citizens. So the order of national artists shares similarities with um, orders, decorations, and medals of other countries. For instance, um, those recognizing uh, contributions to their national culture. Let me see, we have uh, the US National Medal for the Arts, and then you have um, the Order of Culture of Japan, mm. those examples. Sir Resil has always been the preferred uh, historian of uh, the Aboitises and uh, even for their foundation. For one, he actually made the Aboitis family uh, book, and uh, if, if I may show you this one. And for us, this is already a, a very big help, especially for the different corporations, the different uh, foundations under the Aboitises, because everything actually uh, arises from uh, the beginnings of the family. So uh, the, the scholarship of Sir Resil in the uh, in this book is, is very helpful and uh, that's also the same reason why uh, the Aboitises are a very, uh, how do you call this, uh, a family that really chooses uh, who they want to, to write their stories. And so when they got, after the, they got Sir Resil for the Aboitis family a book, when they thought of uh, for of having the foundation's history written, uh, definitely the, the first person that came to their mind was Sir Resil again. And so uh, the foundation called Ramon Aboiti Foundation uh, book is also uh, written by Sir Resil Mojares. But way before I think both books came about, uh, Sir Resil was already writing in the 1980s. He already wrote the Casa Gordo Museum book. What you see is actually the, the new edition, it's also done by Sir Resil. The first edition was published in the 1980s and it even won the National Book Award for Social Sciences. And uh, that is why we had to reprint this book because it became out of stock. And uh, that, that book was is really like a. Uh, how do you call this? A sumbanan ba of of the, uh, it, the the writing about the museum, about the life of the community. The museum is part of. Uh, that was something else that was like a milestone, and so uh, we had to reprint that because that's a very important book. What is important about this uh, book of Sir Resil on Casa Gordo is that it does not talk only of the house, but it situates the house within the community it belongs to. It mentions, actually it, it discusses about uh, not only the people that lived in Casa Gordo before, but also the people that were, that shaped the community that Casa Gordo was a part of. 
And so this is a very important history, historical book actually also of Parian. And Parian, as we know of, is a very, uh, is a very important district also in its time, uh, especially because it, it became the richest actually district uh, for a time here in Cebu. And the families that it, uh, uh, it nurtured, it, uh, uh, the, the families that, uh, that, that lived in the area was, uh, were very important families. They also shaped uh, not just the district, not just uh, the city, but also the entire province as well. The beauty with the book of Sir Resil on Casa Gordo, uh, I think that's the reason why it became, uh, it was awarded uh, the National Book Award because it's uh, it not only talks about the house and uh, it not only describes the house, the Casa Gordo, but it also, even in the different spaces of the house, uh, Sir was able to glean uh, what kind of lifestyle uh, the people at the time um, lived and uh, it even also situates the house uh, within the community that it belonged to and it not only talked about the lives of the people that lived within the house but also uh, the lives of people that belong to the community surrounding the house so yes in in terms of uh, uh, a social study the book Casa Gordo in Cebu of Sir Resil Mojares was, uh, I think, a milestone actually in terms of uh, social history. Sir Resil is also known for writing family histories uh, of important families here in Cebu and definitely one of them was uh, the Aboitis family. This book, The Aboitis Family and Firm in the Philippines, traces the history of the Aboitis family from there in Spain and up to uh, their beginnings here when they transferred to the Philippines there in, in uh, Ormoc and uh, up to their transfer to, to Cebu and, and the impact that they had on not just the Cebuano community but even in the Philippine, in the nation rather and you have uh, not just in the in the sense of the the business aspect or the economic aspect but also um, even uh, w when he mentions when he discusses or when he tells the story of the family he tells also the story of the time so he always situates that uh, the people within the time, the milieu that they lived in at the time. So uh, it's a very important book. If I'm not mistaken, this also were the one of the first uh, family histories that Sir Resil wrote about. And I think if, if uh, again, if uh, if I may say, fa Sir Resil um, made it. Uh, I think he was the one who popularized the writing of family histories. So uh, that's very important. And uh, another is that he made, I mentioned that he made the book, The Foundation, called Ramon Aboitis. And this book traces the history of um, the Ramon Aboitis Foundation Incorporated. I don't think anyone has written uh, so well anything about uh, about foundations, no? And, and, uh, and again, it, the, the foundation is, because it's a family foundation, it also again situates the, uh, the foundation in relation to the lives of the founder. And uh, for me, who works in, in uh, the Ramon Aboitis Foundation Incorporated. When I, this, this book is very important to me because uh, when we work, we always try to align ourselves to the values of our founders. And we get a glimpse of how the founders were there, uh, the, the, the philanthropic or the, the charitable works they, they started with and, and how they grew the foundation to become uh, 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 a social development institution that it is now, uh, we can trace it, and we. But more importantly, we can also see uh, how these people really had the heart to to serve, and we can only uh, glean that. We glean that actually from uh, the the narratives, the the stories that Sir Resil was able to collect in the book. So for us who are working in in Rafi, this is very important uh, to us. Uh, who would like to be aligned to uh, the mission and the vision of our founders. I think um, the conferment of Sir Resil uh, of, uh, as national artist for literature um, is a, 
for us a, a very big thing for Asurbanos first and foremost not only because uh, he was uh, the first is the first Cebuano national artist, and we've been trying to to really get one of our own uh, Cebuanos uh, uh, awarded or uh, conferred that uh, national artist award. But I, th for in the sense that uh, the, what is really also important uh, with the conferment of Sir Resil is that it is not just about. Uh, literature no, itself in, in the, the usual definition of literature but it's because uh, he gave literature another dis uh, how do you call it? widened its description rather uh, in that it he now includes um, the different disciplines and so there's interdisciplinarity um, like history uh, anthropology uh, sociology and in even and not just the creative writing, no, but they also have um, uh, so many aspects of, of uh, the social sciences um, uh, that he considers or that he actually incorporates in his body of works. Um, what I, I I think is very important here is that Sir Resil brings about the stories, no, and, and I'm not talking of stories that are imagined, no, but it is our stories that are real. And, and even if you say these stories are real and there's no, uh, what is, uh, how do you call that? Can I, um, they're very creatively written and, um, and these are stories that you would think that uh, it's very, um, how do you call this? Uh, it's really just for history, no? But uh, when you read Sir Wessel's books and articles and his writings, his body of works, you know that um, this is the stories may be real, but he what what the Sir Resil does is he really how do you call that takes a, he he peeks on every every pebble that is found in the path of that that uh, narrative on that story, and he includes that and tries to get a, 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 a Sir is actually a very good at um, as and how do you call that, Mom? Can I, and then he, he analyzes. He analyzes really well, and and includes working in in social uh, development. That is very important to us because uh, we study Sir Resil's works because it gives us an idea also how we should be able to how the perspective we should be able to take when we see uh, societies or communities actually, and and how we see people, and uh, that is a. For us uh, here working for for uh, for the foundation, um, that is uh, how do you call that? It's like a, a, a something that we really aspire to do. It is some, it, Sir is actually demonstrating, modeling us on how we should be looking closely at the communities we work with. Dr. Rizal Muharis established the Cebuano Studies Center in 1975. Since then, the collection of the center have grown from different donations and active acquisitions. So the library has become the repository of everything Cebuano, from newspapers to manuscripts and books and even recordings. Dr. Mahara's vision for the center has enriched the scholars on Cebuano studies in the area of literature, language, history, and much more and he still actively comes to give us new materials for the archives. Theatre and Society, Society and Theatre, A Social History of a Cebuano Village, 1840-1940, is one of Russell Moharis' best works of scholarship. In this valuable contribution to Philippine art and history, he reconstructs the social and historical life of Valladolid, uh, Barrio in Karkar, Cebu, by tracing the changes in the dynamics of the Linambay theater tradition. My mom is from Karkar, and we used to drive by the Valladolid marker whenever we visited her hometown. So Karkar has always been to me a familiar yet simultaneously distant place. Russell Maharas opened that secret and distant world of Karkar for me. I say secret and distant because I had always thought it to be inaccessible, lost in time, and to the dim memories of my mom who grew up mostly in the city. Two things left deep impressions on me. I was struck first by his meticulous attention to details, from genealogies, maps, census and tax records, land titles, lists of sponsors, and patrons of arts, and other similar documents, he pieced together uh, the social, moral, and economic order of Valladolid. I was also immediately impressed by his skill as a storyteller, 
There is no doubt about it, Russell Maharas is a master storyteller. His ability to find that perspective in history and turn it into an interesting story has come to be one of his most enduring trademarks. Few are able to approach the past as imaginatively and historically as Russell Maharas does. The comedia is a transitional and polygenetic form. It is at the same time history and folk romance, literate and oral, foreign and native, modern and traditional. In its themes and style of composition, it partakes of the world of oral culture, both that of foreign countries from which the narratives were derived and the Philippines into which these were assimilated. On the other hand, it is already part of an evolving book culture, not only because it is derived from books, but it also tends towards the values of written texts. It makes use of handed down historical materials from Europe and thus tends toward history, although in many cases it is already a history mediated by a folk medium in its countries of origin. Yet it is not history. It is less interested in European historical events and personages as in their being matter to be worked into the frame of a broken down yet still strongly traditional epic narrative. In this wise, the laws of geography, causality, and, hi and historicity give way to the logic of folk narration. The Linambay is complex. Like the society in which it thrives, it too is shaped by conflicting impulses. If it manages to achieve a balance among these impulses, this balance can be explained in this way. The society where it exists is also engaged in a similar balancing act. So I first met Russell Moharis at the 2010 Cornelio Feigao Memorial Writers Workshop, which was also the first workshop I attended uh, as an undergraduate student. So Sir Russell, as we fondly call him, was one of the panelists at that workshop. And at the time, I did not yet know him personally. Uh, but over time, as uh, the more I got into literature, uh, the more I encountered his works, the more I uh, grew to be more familiar with him, and I learned to respect him more and more, uh, and be in awe of him more and more over time. So I'm, uh, I've learned to look at history in a very different way because of the writings of Russell Maharis. So I think what makes Sir Russell's writing unique and distinct uh, and even different compared to most other uh, historical writers or historians is that Sir Russell's writing has a certain literary flourish to it. So whereas uh, historical writers would probably read more uh, academic or would simply just describe what they observe. Sir Russell's writing has an almost essay-like or even narrative quality to it. So when you read uh, Russell Muharis' essay, you're not just learning about history, but you're also gaining insights as to how he uh, thinks, his own interpretations of these historical circumstances. And uh, although you might not always agree with him or you might see things differently down the line, um, in one way or another, his opinions will uh, somehow influence you and even uh, affect how you yourself view and understand history from our modern perspective. So my one of my favorite works of Russell Moharis is titled The Brief and Blessed Life of Miguel Ayatumo. It's taken from this collection, Waiting for Maria Makiling, Essays in Philippine Cultural History, published by Ateneo de Manila Press. So what I find unique about this essay is uh, already quite evident in the title alone. So whereas Moharis uh, Whenever he writes about certain historical figures, it's usually someone who most Filipinos would immediately recognize. So, for example, Antonio Pigafetta, Andres Bonifacio, Vicente Soto. These are just some uh, individuals in history 
who Mujeres has written whole pieces about. So, uh, this Miguel Ayatumo figure, he was an early Christian convert from the island of Bohol, and he would have largely been forgotten by history had a biographical sketch of his not been affixed to a larger manual on the Christian virtues that co native converts were expected to uh, uphold or exhibit. So this manual was produced or published in the late 1600s, almost a century after uh, Miguel Ayatumo had passed away. Because Miguel Ayatomo has largely been forgotten in the larger tapestry of Philippine history, uh, any new reader of this particular book could easily gloss over the essay uh, containing his name. But if you're to read The Brief and Blessed Life of Miguel Ayatomo, you would actually uh, learn a lot of things, more specific details as to how the Christianization of the Philippines went about and how this was tied to the larger colonial project of subduing native populations and exploiting them for the benefit of an imperial center, in this case, Spain. Um, Morris also makes certain points on how writing is a political act, specifically how the writer represents their subjects uh, in the eyes of the reader. So if you are, um, if you want to know more about uh, how the Christianizing of the Philippines went about in the early years of the Spanish colonial period in the 1500s and 1600s, or if you just want to know more, if you're a practicing writer who wants to know more about the ethics of representation or the politics of uh, just how much power the writer exercises in representing certain subjects, then The Brief and Blessed Life of Miguel Ayatumo is worth checking out. It can be found, once again, in this collection. So my hope for Resil Mujeres, or Sir Resil, is that he continues to produce more writings on Philippine or Cebuano history, so he can give us readers uh, who are uh, contemporaneous with him, uh, a, a broader perspective or a larger view on Philippine history that is not taught to us in classrooms or in textbooks. I also hope that Sir Resil will not be the will not just be the first or the only national artist uh, from Cebu. I hope other writers or artists uh, practicing in other mediums from Cebu or who associate with Cebu will also gain uh, the same acclaim and recognition as he has. The secret biographer grapples with the basic dualism, that of presenting on one hand the historical, empirical, and individual, the record of a person's life, and on the other, the metahistorical, metaphysical, and exemplary, that is, traces of the divine indwelling in human life. As Heffernan points out, the Vita Sancti moves between praxis, in which a life is summed up in a chronological manner, and ethos, the rigorous and interpretive discussion of a character. If the text is weighted too far toward the supernatural, we lose the man, while if the exemplary is underemphasized, we end up without our saint. In medieval saints' lives and in numerous examples of the form in Spanish colonial literature in the Philippines, the balance weighs too heavily toward the metaphysical and the exemplary. I first met Resil when he was my teacher. 1972, I think, no? He was my teacher in folklore. So my first connection with him was not through literature, but through folklore. And because of that, uh, I was, well, uh, I, I, I entered the world of folklore and it has become until now one of my favorite passions. 
and in his class I I uh, I did research on Maria Cacao and that's how Maria Cacao came to be popular now because of my research actually it was published here and there and presented in conferences well, first as a teacher and then as my boss in 1975 uh, I received a P PhD fellowship from Siliman but that was only for the semesters I was already teaching at San Carlos 1969 but in 1975 um, I, I got this grant but I didn't have work for summer and so I had a family and I asked him sir do you have anything for me to do and uh, luckily there was a project that was dropped by somebody else another faculty member was there it was a series of folklore uh, you have the folk songs and uh, yeah that and and uh, folk tales so you have three so I did that for him and so every summer I was uh, in in the center doing work and then finally when I graduated well, during my uh, PhD orals, uh, he was also in the panel. And actually, not just in the panel, but he was my informal uh, advisor. My teacher, my ad my real advisor was an American, so what did he know about uh, Subhano literature? I was doing work on the three words of one novel. And it was Resil who guided me through and gave me some uh, sources and, of course, uh, encouragement. And all this time I was, I was working, I was teaching, uh, there, uh, I was doing my dissertation here. Took me eight years to do that because I I read uh, Balong Kusab from cover to cover, every page, from 1950 to 1941. And so my uh, said, "You don't really need all that because it was a very uh, thick uh, thick dissertation." I said, "You scrap this. You don't really need that. You you use only what is you know uh, directly." Uh, Direct, directly usable for my dissertation. But uh, be because of that experience, and uh, of course the Subano Study Center collection, it's not just Bangun Puso but other sources as well, I, I became uh, well, in involved in all the other research projects that were, that were assigned to me. No? Um, I was his I was research assistant from nine, 1978, uh, I left Siliman, 1978 to until he, he uh, was promoted to the directorship of the San Carlos Publications. I was research assistant and research associate, and then uh, and finally I was, I was uh, his successor as director. So as teacher, as boss, as uh, advisor, but uh, more than that as a, a colleague, as uh, say co-translator, co-editor, co-worker in uh, several projects. And one thing that uh, that he he initiated, which I think is very important and until now, is the uh, series of research aids that uh, we that we did no for in in various uh, fields. Like I did one on folklore, he did his in, in language, and he also have history, and uh, of course uh, literature. And when I became a director, I, I continued that. Aside from that. Uh, it was Resil who, who pushed me into uh, participating in conferences and introduced me to NCCA and all those organizations. And uh, for example, my first conference paper was on literary translation. And uh, he, he said he could not do it because he had another commitment. And that was how it is. Now, with the media director of the center, you have um, multitasking and you're into many things at once. So I said, can you please do this for me? I said, okay. So I, w I went to UP <laughs> and uh, gave that paper and it was, it was published in QPQCS also. And, and then um, his uh, organizing conferences here also, like the Folklore, Folklore uh, Congress in 1984. Uh, I presented the Maria Cacao uh, paper there. And, and then uh, aside from that, when he was out of the country because he was on a, a collecting binge no? in many places like in, uh, especially in the United States, he got grants for the acquisition of uh, Cebuaniana. No? I was left to hold the fort and, and this means I, I edited the, the paper which, which was supposed to be his. This is the, the, the Bulletin of Local Folklore and History and I really enjoyed that because I had to keep up with all the research, uh, th all the uh, scholarly things uh, in the Philippines, no? not just Cebu, 
that was going on so I had to read and so forth and what else aside from that uh, co co editor of uh, the Toyota Toyota Grant books so uh, that is one of poetry two volumes co editor and co translator so one of uh, short story two volumes and uh, so one of drama no and then of course our uh, other other collaborations that we did would be in the history of San Carlos in the rest of San Carlos so he did the history uh, the old part uh, San Carlos since since it was still San Ildefonso until it became a university and then I did the war years and then Jubers took care of uh, the rest until contemporary and then the important uh, project which the center was very much a part of was the provincial history project and Resil was uh, Resil and I were in the provincial history committee and of course my husband too was uh, the manager of the whole project and we worked uh, very closely together in this and uh, helped train our writers and so forth. So what else is there? Of course personally uh, as a friend uh, he's has always been there for me supporting me whenever I, I felt like uh, giving up no not just my dissertation but uh, other works and uh, what else uh, <laughs> if you're talking about publications then uh, I can cite the ones on local the, the, the local scene so the first one was his dissertation origins and rise to so the Filipino novel though that is not just Cebuano but uh, that is an important uh, book it's seminal and it has uh, it has been the let's say uh, re research uh, reference for many many writers on local literature, and then uh, his theater in society and society in theater, which was a pioneering work in the study of uh, the linen by a local dramatic form, and not just the form itself, but how it got uh, involved in how how it involved the community, no. Another one would be his uh, war against Americans, which is a local. And uh, for that, he used a lot of the materials that he collected when he was abroad, no? from the Library of Congress and other universities. Um, and then um, our, our um, pioneering work, which, is not, which hasn't been uh, done in the whole of the Philippines, just a province-wide uh, history. And he wrote the history of the whole province of Cebu, which is, I think, uh, very well done and with all the materials that he has. And then he's, he, he, of course, not only uh, has written on local, as I said, even the rice, Origins and Rice was, was national. But another important work of his would be about the intellectual movement in the Philippines. And, and this is in his book brains of the nation and i should not uh, i should not forget also casa gorordo which is already in its second uh, second revision a uh, second edition casa gorordo in cebu aside from the many you know conference papers and which which were uh, collected in his uh, the reader published by usc i first heard of resil mohares in the early 1990s when I found a copy of the House of Memory in the Filipiniana section of the University of San Carlos Library. And I do not think it a retrospective fantasy to say that I remember the experience of first reading it. I was shocked and taken aback and pulled in. I felt like I was in the presence of truth um, not truth in the sense of getting the facts right, but truth in the sense of getting the essence of the idea, getting to the bottom of something. And I, it seemed like the author must have so much information to put into words about we are what we eat or walking through places as a kind of pilgrimage. Um, the author shared many important ideas about things we often take for granted. And so in a sense, um, others can wholeheartedly embrace them. So 
a house of memory was not merely a theoretical quest, it seemed, but a quest for practical and emotional understanding. And uh, I felt like uh, he wanted, at least as I was a reader, he wanted to communicate that understanding to the readers. Um, the House of Memory seems to be a timeless um, book, and it's also contagious in that sense uh, throughout the country and you know, in other countries as well, all over the world, we have so-called houses of memories. And we regularly assume not only that the others are remembering, but that which or what is remembered. Now, I've read this book repeatedly over the years. You can't, I can't count how many, how many times and my first experience has only been reinforced. It is uh, definitely a classic. Then I first met Dr. Mahares briefly when he was going down the stairs from the second floor of the National Bookstore at Mango Avenue, and I was going up uh, trying to find a book. I introduced myself and told him that I read his book. Uh, but he seemed to be in a hurry. Later, I studied Resil Mojares' origins and rise of the Filipino novel when I did my doctorate program in comparative literature. And I found it quite impressive as it clearly demonstrates the social, economic, and political forces that shaped the Filipino novel until the 1940s. So it was not just a chronological account, but uh, it analyzed and evaluated the internal developments of the indigenous traditions to which it belonged. And all the details, wow, the book blew me. If I remember right, the study was based on about 170 primary texts. Most of these were novels. And I think on about six languages, if we think about it, we have Spanish, English, Tagalog, Cebuano, and I think there was also Hiligaynon and Iloko. Yeah, so that would be about six languages. And, um, there was a trace of, you know, the pre-colonial tradition of folk narratives like epics interacting with, uh, with forces, like colonial forces, and being modified by the foreign forms like um, the corrido, which were introduced by the Spaniards. So then, you have the book of conduct, and then later you had the vernacular uh, novel, and then uh, the novel in English. So being able to see uh, the forces in the literary tradition that occasioned the shifts um, leading to the rise of the novel and constituted its formation and then you have the social circumstances that analyzes the internal shifts, explaining the particular characteristics of the Filipino novel as we know it to be, being didactic, uh, socialistic, and, and nationalistic. Then uh, Doc Resil became my professor in the certificate course in Cebuano Heritage Studies. I came to know more about the man who established the pioneering research center in local studies in the Philippines, uh, the Cebuano Studies Center, which I currently head. Uh, as founding director of the Cebuano Studies Center of the University of San Carlos, uh, this was about uh, 1975 until 2000, 
and through such organizations and networks like the Philippine Folklore Society, um, the Philippine National Historical Society, and the National Conference on Local History, oh, and also the Committee on Literary Arts of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, uh, Doc Rasil is acknowledged as one of the leading figures in the movement that promoted local and regional literature and history, especially in the 1970s and the 1980s. And uh, on this basis, on January 20, uh, 1999, uh, the Centennial Awards for the Arts of the Cultural Center of the Philippines uh, chose him as uh, one of the uh, 100 outstanding Filipinos who have helped build the nation through arts and culture during the last 100 years. Doc Ressel started as a prize-winning fictionist uh, in 1966 until about 1971, and his stories appeared in national publications like uh, the Philippines Free Press and um, the Philippine Graphic. And these stories include Island, uh, In the Cave, um, Loud, A Sickness in the, in the Towns, uh, and Beast in the Fields, although his most widely anthologized story is The Ark. Dr. Mohares, however, shifted his focus to literary um, historical and cultural studies and has built a national and international reputation as one of the leading scholars in Philippine studies. For the past about 55 years, he has produced a body of work distinguished for the quality of its writing, uh, the range and versatility, as well as the depth of research, theoretical sophistication, and um, groundbreaking approach to varied, often neglected aspects of Philippine studies. So over that span of time, I suppose from 19... 86 until the present, no? uh, Dr. Mohares has published in diverse forms, um, fiction, essays, uh, journalism, and scholarly articles and books, you know, across a wide range of fields, literature, history, we have biography, um, historical and cultural studies, and so much more. So to date, we could say that he has published about 17 books and three more are in the press. Uh, I, I'm just guessing three, I, maybe there's five. Edited, co-edited, or co-authored 11 books and written numerous articles for popular and scholarly publications. Dr. Mohares has a lot of significant contributions. I mean, in the field of literary history, for instance, origins and rise of the Filipino novel, a generic study of the novel until 1940, which was published by University of the Philippines Press in 1983 and was reprinted in 1998. And then I think I just saw the third reprint, which came out this year. Uh, 34 years after the book first appeared, you know, it's still unsurpassed as the best book on the origins and early development of the Filipino novel. In the field of biography, the man who would be president, Serhing Osmeña and Philippine Politics, which was published in 1986, is very important and one of the readers from the University of Hawaii. I think it was Professor Belinda Aquino who wrote, um, it was a tour de force 
in Philippine political biography and told of a compelling story of Philippine politics. In the field of the essay and cultural studies, we have Waiting for Mariang Makiling, Essays in Philippine Cultural History, and this was published by Ateneo de Manila University Press in 2002. And Isagani Cruz, uh, the scholar and critic, wrote that Mojares is a major structuralist or post-structuralist or post-modern critic in this part of the world and that Mojares has not indigenized contemporary Western critical theory. Instead, he has universalized traditional Philippine critical theory. Like Rizal, Mojares never seeks knowledge for its own sake, but always in his own words, knowledge at his country's service. And he wrote this in an article, Critic at Large, which was published in Business Asia. Then another very important contribution as well in the field of theater and social history, we have theater in society, society in theater, the social history of a Cebuano village from 1840 to 1940. It spans a, an entire century. And this was published by the Ateneo de Manila Press in 1985. Uh, this is actually a very exemplary, innovative, strongly researched work that stands as a model in the writing of both theater and local history. Another contribution in the field of local history is the war against the Americans, resistance and collaboration in Cebu, 1899 until 1906, published by Ateneo de Manila University Press. And Dr. Abinales of the University of Hawaii uh, said that the war against the Americans is a gem of a book. It is a delightful read and further confirms my belief that Resil Mojares is the foremost intellectual of our country today. Uh, this was in the Leg Manila, um, November 15, 1999. In the field of creative nonfiction or the essay, another significant contribution is the House of Memory essays published by Anvil Publishing in 1997. And Dr. Caroline Howe of the Kyoto University Center for Southeast Asian Studies wrote, arguably the foremost scholar of our time, Mohares has produced a good number of books that are already considered classics. Uh, Mojares is living proof that good writing and theoretically sophisticated thinking are not mutually exclusive. In a literary scene cluttered with well-written fluff, Mojares is his own solitary standard of excellence. And this was published in Leg Manila, January 4, of 2000. To add to the field of essays and creative nonfiction is Isabella's archive, which was published by Anvil in 2013. To add, okay, uh, sa House of Memory, after atong House of Memory ba? To add to the House of Memory, we have Isabella's archive which was published by Anvil Publishing in 2013. And the writer Jessica Safra says that Isabella's archive is a delightful compendium of essays on a wide range of historical subjects. And in the field of intellectual history biography, there is Brains of the Nation, Pedro Paterno, T.H. Pardo de Tavera, Isabelo de los Reyes, and the Production of Modern Knowledge, published by the Ateneo de Manila Press uh, in 2006.
thinking about writing. Yeah, mainly. But that's kind of, you know, basically fun. Reading. I uh, recall, uh, I don't know, I, I, I think on first, was, but this was kind of uh, very juvenile, mga high school student. There was a time when kind of, I thought of uh, becoming a lawyer, but this was kind of just perhaps because I was at the time reading a great deal of kind of, uh, Perry Mason, now Perry Mason <laughs> novels. In fact, I was talking to the Augusto Go, uh, and he was saying, "Most of the young first ambition to be a, to be a lawyer because uh, he also read a lot of the kind of Earl Stanley Gardner novels. Uh, Perry Mason is a very popular kind of uh, paperback, and then uh, of course." He kind of pursued it and became a lawyer, but then, but he discovered that uh, you don't really earn much, you know, about as a lawyer. And he said that uh, also he was not really suited. So anyway, so he kind of still, of course, he's a lawyer, but he's a non-practicing. So I, I suppose, kind of, uh, that really was just a passing one thought. I, I think uh, from the. From early on, Moraga, kind of, uh, it was really writing that I enjoyed. Except, nga, of course, at the time, particularly at the time, when you think of being a writer, you don't really think of it as a as a job, because kind of like kind of, I mean, you don't expect that there will be any monetary monetary rewards from it, which kind of in. Uh, in most cases, it's still, it's still true today. So you don't really think of it as a more like profession. You think of it as a more kind of a vocation. Uh, vocation. So like, more like writers generally, to think of a job, and then if they have the time, they would like to pursue writing uh, as well. So. So writing was, I think, from high school, was something that I enjoyed, and uh, enjoyed it so much. Uh, I, we had uh, because I grew up in Dipolog, Samuaga del Norte, in a provincial high school, it's a public school, and I was editor of the school organ. Uh, and uh, and then because I was a more memeograph newsletter. So what I would do is, I could do one whole issue by myself, editorial, news stories, poetry, essays, so Marag Silvin, I can do one, one, one whole issue by myself. And not only do one whole issue by myself, but in fact cut the, cut the stencils for a graph, meaning I can by myself produce a whole, a whole. but it does kind of, uh, it does something that I, uh, something that I uh, enjoyed. So I suppose an inter interest in writing came started in uh, even science school. Uh, I can't really, nothing really in, in uh, particular. Parang, parang, uh, Oh, yeah, well, kind of special fondness for kind of exotic, spicy uh, food in the world. But uh, food is not really... I mean, there was a time that, in fact, like, kind of, I kind of got an interest in it because uh, we became close friends with Doreen Fernandez and myself. Because Doreen Fernandez was one of the earliest you know, scholars that were kind of, kind of, in a sense, kind of a mother figure type, so, and then Sidori Fernandez, of course, is the top kind of uh, food scholar in the country. Right? So uh, it was fun being with her. Okay? She knows exactly where the the where 
because she was doing a food column for one of the major new, uh, newspapers. You know, and then she was very professional about it. Uh, kind of professional with being a food writer. Like, kind of uh, rules like you don't tell in advance the restaurant that you will be there. You always pay for the food that you, so you don't get like uh, free food. So you can like make a really kind of objective assessment of the of the food. So parang you don't you go there without announcing that you are going. And second, that you always make it a point that you pay for what you pay for what you order. So she was a kind of a, and so she kind of uh, just fun being with her because kind of you can be sure you you are going to eat well. I recall one time she was in Cebu and she. She wanted to find out what's her favorite breakfast uh, among Cebuanos and then went to the pier early on. Can I finding out exactly what work can I for port stevedores for instance, what they eat and then the type of uh, can I, uh, and uh, so she's but otherwise except for that association with Doreen, kind of food is just not something you can I'm kind of I enjoy it but it's not really something that I kind of uh, uh, although I've written a few things uh, on the subject. In fact, NCCA recently came out with a book of food and literature, Marakana. And uh, so it's a series of articles on food in, food in liter literature and so on. And they used uh, one of the articles, one of the articles. One of the articles there is mine, a reprint of, I, I wrote an essay entitled Deciphering a Meal, which actually was written, uh, uh, which was actually written for Doreen Fernandez because she had retired and they, Ateneo published a fresh script for, for her and asked for a contribution. So I had to think of something uh, that had something to do with uh, food. And so at the time I, came across a topic you now which was kind of fortunate in the sense of like doing research you know, more kind of you start writing about something because you come across something that's interesting. And this was as I was going through issues of the Bulletin de Cebu, which is the first Cebu newspaper. I came across this news item about some I can't remember now uh, a, a big event in Cebu. I think it was the feast of the feast of uh, what is that? San Vidal. You know, San Vidal is nobody, very few people know about it. It's officially the patron saint of uh, of uh, Cebu City. And anyway, in the Spanish colonial period, that was a big occasion because, in a sense, the um, feast of San Vidal is also the fiesta of the city uh, of the, Span the Spanish ciudad. As it were. And so it was, uh, and I was. My attention was caught by a news item about the official reception at uh, you know, where all the top officials uh, of Cebu were present at dinner for. It was not kind of a select group, probably like around, there were just 15 or two, at most 20 people at the dinner table, but it was in a sense the, one of the highlights of the fiesta or a kind of this grand dinner of the top. And so what, what was interesting is that there was a, they printed the menu of the, for the dinner and then uh, also listed the people who were there. So the first time I saw it right off, I said, wow, this is almost like a portrait of who's the most important people in Cebu. I mean, kind of a who's who. So this was probably like or something like 18 around 1890. Early morning, but it's only uh, it's actually only with the pandemic that I now get up very early in the morning. <laughs> because ordinarily my day pre-pandemic was I. I uh, usually kind of uh, get out of bed late, probably around 
nine, and then we'll transfer to the family room where I turn on the TV and also like kind of continue sleep, uh, sleeping. So kind of my day actually starts around 10 o'clock. So, uh, so, so, uh, and then I, I leave the house, yeah, around 10, 10.30. And, uh, and my routine is to spend the whole day out, out, of, uh, out of the house. So probably like from mid or late morning until like uh, four. So I'm home before five o'clock, but out of the house by around 10. And uh, my normal day is to go from coffee shop to coffee shop. So uh, I probably like kind of average around three coffee shops a day. So uh, kind of because uh, kind of, I kind of like being on the move Kind of, I, it's, I find it difficult, kind of, it's only with the pandemic that kind of this idea of staying in the house the whole day is kind of, because I usually like to, and then, uh, and, and uh, so like, and of course you can't stay in one coffee shop, you know, I mean, kind of, uh, being a, a coffee drinker, kind of, uh, you have kind of familiar with the coffee shop courtesies, you know, like when you don't stay too long uh, because you're going to kind of, the problem with running up a, a coffee shop, running up a, a co coffee shop business is that you use normal, you'll have a lot of people who stay too long and order just a cup of coffee. I mean, how can you kind of, uh, so, so uh, of course what has made the coffee shop business uh, not only viable but profitable is mga specialty drinks no? so not really kind of you know coffee kind of service no? of course a markup you know, for the specialty drinks is higher but a cup so the um, problem is you have to be you know, uh, elementary court to see that you don't you can stay uh, kind of somewhat long if you know that the place is practically empty, but once kind of uh, th there are people there, you don't want to stay too long, so at least you know. I'm not really kind of, uh, not, not into music, not particularly kind of a regular movie watcher. In fact, even as a parang as an interest, parang, it's not something that I really. These are topics that I don't really write about. So, uh, like for instance, movies. Uh, my sense is that in there are already a lot of people who kind of do movie criticism, uh, film criticism. So, kind of, uh, kind of. Uh, I, I don't. I, I don't uh, so, uh, and. Uh, so even like kind of uh, the visual arts, I'm not really, or theater, I'm not really kind of, uh, so. My wife says, but I think she's not correct, and she kind of tends to exaggerate that I'm anti-social, anti uh, but uh, which, which is kind of uh, true in a, in a sense because uh, kind of I, I, in, in the sense that kind of, you know, I'm not a party boy. And uh, secondly, I don't uh, seek out, uh, like for instance, like talking to people who, especially if these are people who are kind of, in a sense, uh, higher up, more influential than, uh, than you are. And my tendency always is like kind of, like an example, for instance, like uh, the mayor, you know, see Lavelle, I mean, he knows me and kind of, and uh, I think mainly because even nephew of his, he is a writer, see John Lavelle, uh, so anyway, but, but I would not go out of my way to see him, or even if I see people parang in, a, in a gathering, for instance, I would wait for them to approach me, then I approach them, you know, in that sense, uh, kind of a social 
it's my wife says also kind of PR for me is a bad word. I'm not uh, into social media. So, uh, like about, I have a, a, a phone, for instance. I've not even once used its camera. I've not, I'm, it's because one is I don't even know how, and I'm not interested in knowing how. So, uh, so I do it only for like uh, for for uh, call and text. And uh, normally I don't call. You know, kind of, uh, I kind of I, I support that kind of a case of techno techno. Uh, 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 phobia, so uh, I'm not into kind of gadgets or social media. And uh, in fact, uh, yesterday I had a problem with a computer. I, I don't know what happened, but suddenly I cannot access it. Can I, uh, because the icon uh, where which, which appears. I mean, it started with like kind of the icon where you, if you want to shut down the, but it doesn't work. And then uh, the following day, when I um, opened it, so um, what do you call the page uh, came out, and uh, what do you call it? Can I, where you have the picture and so on. Yeah. But w w without the icons for mm -hmm. something. Yes. No. So uh, she's the only one with me. It's a, a, it's a, by, it's a do daughter of mine, and she's not also. It, that much into computer, but my son who's in Hong Kong is, of course, that's his expertise. So, so number of okay, a number of occasions when we have a problem, she, she would call him and show him kind of cell phone, show the screen and so on, and and he kind of yes fixed it, uh, fixed it uh, uh, very very quick uh, quickly. But uh, kind of, my son complains now because that I don't want to learn because because he'd explain something to me. Say, don't explain, just fix it. So uh, so I'm I'm now interested in interested in learning. In fact, the first time I bought a computer, I had to buy one because I had a grant which included that if you don't have a computer, you can. There's money that you get to buy itself. I bought one, and but uh, it's 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 I am impatient with having to learn something. So when I the only instruction I had was as part of the sale of the you get X you set a few hours of tutorial <laughs> tutorial. So that's the only tutorial I had, and I, I told the person that all I wanted needed to do was. To word processing. That's in, you know. Don't, don't uh, explain to me others how to do. So, and it took a long time before I realized how, for instance, to move paragraphs and so on. So for a number of years, that was something I did. I I did not because I have no interest in it, but whatsoever. What I would probably enjoy more if I'm like in, in another city or uh, whether here or abroad is uh, kind of a sense of the uh, street life. And not so much that kind of, you know, just like sitting in a sidewalk cafe and kind of watching the, the passing scene. I mean, that kind of would be, would be, and, and, and kind of, uh, kind of, uh, the, the idea there is kind of to get a sense of what local life is. And not so much like seeing kind of monuments or even muse, muse, museums uh, or kind of, but having a sense of, uh, having a sense of uh, local life. That's why like kind of, if you go travel, I mean, there's no point in like going to a city and just passing through or 
kind of even like one. Uh, my, my sense is like you go to a city, you should stay there like three days at least. So probably after the third day, you get a sense of what the place is like. Like for instance, I enjoyed like uh, like Washington D.C. because uh, that was where where I started to seriously collect books. And this was at that time when like uh, collecting was still kind of uh, uh, great fun. So so uh, it was kind of that's one passion passion of mine also like uh, collecting books. And the I, I started seriously collecting when I was in Washington D.C. because. I was there nine months, so like kind of, you know, you have lots of time. And I was there on a research fellowship, which means that I control my own time. And so, I, and I was doing work in the art, library, the archives. So, so if I, I don't go to the archives for like a day, a day or two or three days, I mean, nobody's taking tra uh, tracking or like what I was doing. I was doing so. I had lots of free time, so that was when I felt that uh, kind of uh, one fun way of spending the time would be to go book hunting. And at the time, kind of, uh, there were still a lot of uh, second-hand bookshops. In fact, uh, uh, I don't know whether you probably don't have it anymore. Like, what you do if you are hunting for books? You go to a bookshop, like a second-hand bookshop an antiquarian or bargain bookshop. And I think in most places I've been to, they usually have an association of mga used book sellers yeah, with a, like kind of a brochure, like a list of all the bookstores and even like a map of like where the, the locations, a brief description of the like uh, specializes in children's books or, or World War II books and so on. So, uh, when I was there, like, what's this, 1981, there were, like, in the greater Washington, D.C. area, that means, kind of Washington, D.C., kind of neighboring Maryland, Virginia, there were something like 35 uh, uh, second bookstores uh, in the whole, kind of. I think I went to all, all, uh, all 35. Uh, and, and it was not easy going finding the bookstores because the, these bookstores are usually in low rent areas because uh, the book business is not, you know, kind of uh, brisk, you know, volume, uh, big volume business. So they usually like are independent booksellers who kind of, in order so the low over overhead is low, they locate themselves in areas where the rent is low, which means these are out of, so you have to like to take two bus rides before you get there. And it's difficult to find them because they're not in kind of, uh, so, you, so the fun, fun thing there is that you get to see places that normally visitors would not, you know, who would go there? But you get to, to go to this, uh, go to this place where you're looking for, where you're looking for, for books, bookstores. And uh, so that was one of the things I really enjoyed when I was uh, uh, in, in the U.S. because kind of I really got into uh, book uh, collecting. Most fun I had looking for books was, I was again with Mike Cullinan in Ann Arbor, and I was in Ann Arbor, and uh, we decided because he's also a great collector of Filipiniana, we decided to go uh, for a whole weekend just looking for uh, bookstores. And this is kind of Michigan, Indiana, uh, two or three states just come going from place to place uh, buying books. And that was the most, the most, uh, the most fun I had when I was in the U.S. because kind of like the uh, and we were kind of, uh, for two or three nights, we like, and, and we, ha we had it, our kind of approach uh, very well. Like what we would do is, we hit a town or a city, and the first thing that my colleague and I would do would be to look for a telephone booth. And you'd go into the telephone booth, and 
there's usually a section for used bookstores in the yellow pages, and they tear out the page. Sure, <laughs> they have a list of used uh, used uh, books, and then go to a say pharmacy, a drugstore, buy a map of the place, uh, the city, and if we have to stay overnight, check into a motel, you know, kind of a cheap motel. And the first thing he do, like when we're checking the motel, he would lay out the map and the list and would mark exactly where all the bookstores are. And so like, uh, so the following day he said, like, we go, this is where we go. Uh, we'll go there, 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 and there. So hit as many of the bookstores as, uh, as possible. So we're like kind of a pair of, of bank robbers, like, you know, like the movie Bonnie and Clyde, except that we were hitting bookstores instead of banks. <laughs> but that was uh, that was great, uh, and the, of course the sad thing is that uh, all those bookstores are now gone. I mean, very few. When a few years ago I I, I, w I was back in Washington D.C. I think of, of the bookstores there, like only very few have remained, and that's because the co the the culprit there is internet. So. Uh, so they kind of, uh, you know, they no longer maintain uh, the book sell booksellers. They no longer maintain stores. They kind of deal in the some internet. Which I was in a conference in Manila. The one who's also like co who collects books is Butch Dalisa. You know Butch Dalisa. Oh, see, Butch appears to be a kind of a late bloomer, as a collector. And he was, there, there was a panel at uh, National Book Development in the conference on book collecting, and he was one of the speakers. And he arrived at the conference with a maleta, maleta he had all his choice items for display, for his talk. <laughs> and it's often for asking the question about parang, uh, parang the yung internet has taken the fun out of uh, book collecting because you know what fun is there you're just doing your hunting on the computer so parang you know the fun of book hunting is that kind of uh, is that you travel you go to bookstores you don't know exactly what you're going to find there i mean that's the, the whole point so but if like you like see what's does like uh, mga ebay or uh, so go on. I feel bad now, like kind of somebody who's just in his office looking at his computer, finding the book earlier than I. I so it's kind of cheating, but kind of, kind of cheating. Where's the fun in book collecting? Of all you do is is uh, find books on the com computer. So so the the whole idea there is that like you are able to see places that you've not been to because you're hunting for hunting for books and and the thing about like uh, hunting for books is when you enter a bookshop you don't know exactly what you'll find there so so but apparently um, um, uh, the internet has really killed the joy of book uh, uh, quality so that's kind of uh, one passion that I have that's why, like, if there were no book sale in the Philippines, I mean, that's kind of, you know, what, what does one do? See, the book sale is the only bright spot in the book trade in the, in, in, in the Philippines. So. Uh, I was in, in Honolulu. Uh, because I was uh, kind of had a, a fellowship at uh, University of Hawaii for one term, I said, like three months, no? uh, one term. So I was, I was there for like uh, three, three and a half months in Honolulu. This was several years ago. And, uh, and housing there was a problem at uh, university. So, so the good thing is that they were able to find uh, a place I could rent, 
which used to be an office building actually, but parang they turned it into re residential units. So, uh, and kind of, I think by Honolulu standards, relatively fun. Yeah. Okay, I'm fun. I'm rent. I can remember now how much it was. Anyway, it was right in walking distance of Waikiki. It's right in the heart of that tourist zone. Uh, so, uh, in, in fact, that kind of, uh, so it's like, like uh, just, you can walk to Waikiki uh, to the beach. And I, I, the great thing about it is that, uh, because one requirement I had, I said, uh, I'm not going to cook, so I'll be eating out kind of all the time. So can I, if there are eating places nearby, uh, that would be perfect. So this place was perfect. It was, uh, it was uh, in a tourist zone, sa Honolulu. There was a 24-hour diner just uh, in uh, the next block. In fact, a kind of a well-known diner in Honolulu. It has been there for forever. So 24 hours. So, so it was it was perfect. So I kind of uh, uh, I never even once, although. Uh, in the course of my stay, I decided that parang I'll kind of set some kind of a record that, that I was in Honolulu for more than three months and not once did I go to Waikiki Beach, which was just a, <laughs> a walk away from a walk away from my from where I was staying. So like kind of I never even once went to the never once went to the beach. So. So everybody goes to the beach. I'll be different. So I'll, I, I have something I can be, I can boast uh, about. That. I was in Honolulu for more than three months. I never once we went to the went to the beach. So, so that shows that although I would kind of like kind of uh, like uh, uh, Honolulu also is that that good uh, place for book. In fact, the only interesting bookstore there is on the other side of the island. So, like, uh, kind of once every few weeks, I would like take the, a bus ride there in order to go to check out the the the, the, book, the bookstore. So. There's several, but kind of. I would say my current favorite, although it's not really that current anymore, is uh, a novelist named W. G. Sebald. He's a, I was supposed to call it, he's German, although he's been based in England, he was based in England for much of his career, so he's kind of almost like Anglo-German, but he's really German. So, uh, but th this was uh, several, uh, some years back. And, and the problem, but this kind of, the, the fact that I like him is such that, you know, you read a, a book by this an, an author, and what you want is to read everything that he has written. Uh, so, kind of, I made it a point to get e everything that he had written. And, but the problem is he died in a car crash. So it was kind of a, kind of a letdown that, there's no more book coming from him. That's it. That's his body of work. Because kind of he kind of died, kind of. He, he could have been even more productive. He said that he, he died you know, in a car crash, in a car crash. So, uh, so, I, so I suppose I, I have all of his books and kind of the disappointment is there's no more I can read because that's it. And then uh, the other one that kind of uh, a recent favorite, also the kind of writer where you read him and you feel like you want to read everything that he has written is a French uh, novelist named Patrick Modiano, who was a Nobel Prize winner several years ago. Uh, I think he was uh, four or five years ago. He was uh, the no uh, Nobel Prize uh, uh, winner. So. Uh, Kind of, uh, I don't kind of uh, like 
academic nonfiction work because you do it because of your work, because you are. But uh, for reading, just for the pleasure of reading, of course, you have to think in terms of like kind of novels and uh, and uh, and uh, so on. And those so those are those are the and. Uh, in fact, like as a book sale, sa the 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 mat the kind of tindero dia sa book sale sa SM. Kind of he's kind of friendly, kind of looks like he's a kind of a smart fellow who kind of pays attention to the books, na ako, because he would usually like present me with books that he he thinks I might uh, uh, I might uh, want. So, uh, we have still telling you, I'm not interested in American authors, so uh, Latin American, European. Uh, so, like if it comes across like kind of uh, kind of uh, an, a non-American uh, name, he would show it to me. <laughs> so <laughs> he would show it to me that I might I might uh, uh, want it. In fact, he was showing me a kind of it, a Spanish name, and I, I said, Oh, can he's a kind of and, um, really an American, kind of, uh, Spanish American, uh, uh, Latino uh, writer. So I thought, no, I'm not interested in it. If I'm going to get a Latin American writer, he has to be based in Latin America, not, not some immigrant in the US. <laughs> so, so I have a certain kind of pet peeves. Uh, in fact, we had that uh, uh, fest literary festivals. Uh, so uh, Ayala, where we had see Jessica Safra as a as a guest, and we had a conversation on stage. And remember, guest Jessica, I don't know where he, who told her that, but Jessica Safra said, "I I understand you don't uh, you don't buy American <laughs> authors." So somebody probably told her that I don't I don't uh, can read American. Uh, Authors, so, so I told her. Uh, I mean, the, the kind of there are all, always exceptions. Yeah, but as a rule, kind of. Uh, because it, so like, and so I was saying, uh, I would spot right kind of. If I say author's name William Jones. I not, not even like bother to look like some really American name. So it has to be like a foreign sound, sound name. And uh, see, Jessica is also kind of very well abreast with the contemporary. And he was saying, ah, so you like authors like Laszlo Krasno Harkai? Yeah, that author. <laughs> so, because, so, 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 because kind of I'm interested in this, particularly East European, you know, my Hungarians, kind of Polish writers, and uh, so, but, so like, if I come across an author now, kind of uh, with like a uh, name like that, I d definitely would like uh, want to see as to who it is. But uh, so. <laughs> well, uh, I'm always reading, so I never stop. But much of the reading I do is kind of. Uh, Related to what I'm working on right now, so like, if so, I have to give a talk on the. I have to give a talk on the revolution in Cebu, so, so Rafi. It's a kind of online, uh, uh, online talk, and uh, so I was uh, telling uh, si Heidi uh, uh, if. Uh, I really did a kind of was that, okay. but I was uh, kind of suggesting uh, as a kinsa ang audience kay, if if uh, uh, na mga top uh, high school students, you know, I would not want to uh, kind of uh, because I would want to talk about a subject uh, I'm interested in and use it, but I would want to like learn also in the process. Meaning, kind of, it's uh, kind of, it's more fun, kind of uh, productive as well as fun, 
if you don't just kind of repeat what you already know, but use the occasion of a talk to learn something new. So but it's a subject that more or less you're familiar with. You can, like, there's something uh, new that you can discover. That makes it work. Makes it worth it. So I, so I said I do want something about a kind of research oriented, like uh, instead of like giving a talk now where you're okay, a problem with uh, even like kind of interviews <laughs> is that uh, there are people who go at a talk or do an interview as a substitute for reading itself, but a kind of it's a it's a lazy way of uh, doing things now. So instead of like reading the book, you just listen to a talk, or kind of uh, instead of uh, kind of uh, so. So what is that uh, kind of? Uh, so I, I kind of. I, I never stop reading because kind of I'm always uh, w working on, on uh, working on uh, working on something uh, and uh, and uh, in fact, Kwanaku is that I usually kind of uh, I mean it's common for me to like be reading three books at the same time. So you read uh, one book and more kind of be beginning to drag. So you, you go back, to, you go to another one, or you go to, so at least parang, it's getting parang a bit boring, you kind of, you parang shift to another, uh, to shift to another one. So, so uh, even if it's something that you have already written about, I mean, it's great if you learn something new about So, uh, so that's why, can I, and uh, mga commemorative occasions are usually kind of not uh, fun. Okay. And, right. I mean, where's the fun if you give a talk on something that, in a sense, you've already talked about so many times uh, before? So it's uh, kind of you have to, even like when I was uh, a te teacher, I'm not, I'm not a very good teacher. But I remember like being a teacher, like, kind of uh, like uh, telling my students, especially like uh, uh, dealing responsive way questions. So I would comment why silamoy loser kind of. I'm the one who's going to come out of this semester the brightest person in this room. Okay? I'm kind of angry. Kind of uh, study the, uh, kind of uh, study the subject. So at the end of the semester, I'm really going to be the brightest person in this in this uh, room because I'm trying to learn as much as I can while uh, I'm here. So, so one I, so and I, I suppose uh, that's something that kind of people, or particularly young people, have to learn. Parang, uh, you, you have a, an appetite, kind of really an appetite for learning, uh, for learning. So, uh, so, uh, so as I told someone, uh, in fact, uh, I had a conversation with Carol Hall in uh, Japan one time. They were talking about uh, the theory here. So, uh, I suppose I, if I think about myself, I'm basically a learner. But I love to. I love to. I love to. Uh, I love to. Uh, uh, to 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 kind of, to learn. So kind of, I don't kind of think of myself as somebody who was already more uh, appetite for uh, appetite for learning. I think that's kind of uh, that's uh, that's very very important now. And, and, and of course, the sad thing is, like for instance, uh, I have a friend, uh, si Rick Petalingho, he's a writer, Cebuan writer. Uh, he lives in, ta in Tabunok. In fact, I've not seen him for a long time eh, because of the pandemic. And also because, one second, he's invalid by his wheelchair. Uh, so, he can, uh, 
So there's a time I would go, I would go to Tabunok uh, once every two or three weeks to check, uh, do, do, do three, three things at the same time. Like one, I go to Tabunok uh, to check out a um, book sale, which is not there anymore. And the Sierra na mga sa Tabunok na book sale. So I go to book sale and see if there's anything interesting. And then if there's that nothing interesting, then I probably have lunch there, a lichon. So, so at least nga maragwa ka masiro ba? You drive all the way to Tabunok, at least you're done. And then the third thing actually is uh, to drop by Rick sa Namjas Tabunok. And usually because he can no longer, uh, he's no longer mobile, I bring uh, books for him. I uh, bring two, three, uh, most like four books for him to read. Because what I like about him, okay, we were like uh, classmates at uh, college. And he's, he's into, li into literature. So, is that he has kept his interest in uh, literature up until this time. Like you have mentioned, like uh, mga new authors and so on. Yeah, he's kind of uh, familiar with who the writers are and so on. Of course, uh, in part because he does a lot of work and uh, uh, com internet uh, work. So he's, which is kind of something admirable and remarkable. Okay, and standard things like, uh, especially if you are my classmates at uh, college, and you have people who kind of are interested in writing and they uh, Usually after, after the university, most, and most common cases, they, they stop. They're no longer interested in like, I suppose you getting pressure about it, like a job and so on. But the more common case is that uh, they stop reading, uh, they stop writing. And, uh, so it's, it's kind of admirable if you have somebody, after so many years, parang interested in one. He has not, he has not, uh, he has not stopped. So like, for instance, uh, my was at college, probably, probably he's the only one who has kind of not lost his appetite, his interest in, in uh, books. All the others, well, why not? Kind of they have moved on to other interests and they kind of, uh, so, uh, so that's uh, kind of uh, having that uh, appetite, having that ap appetite is, uh, kind of uh, uh, remarkable. I don't know, there's so many. <laughs> the things I'm interested in, so many things, so I can't really, it's not easy for me to say. So, uh, that's why like, uh, even like, uh, and uh, usually like, in, in, uh, Foreigners of people, I have, uh, and they they cannot tell as to what I am. So you know, it's a historian, anthropologist. <laughs> so I mean, it's like a place, but on 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 circle because kind of uh, uh, I do anthropology, I do history, I do literature. So kind of uh, so. Uh, Of course, kind of, it's something uh, you feel glad about because uh, kind of it's a form of recognition, and there are, there are benefits that come with it. So, but uh, otherwise, it's uh, it's a good thing, but uh, kind of it doesn't really make you a better writer, a better or a, a lesser. Uh, Right. And ultimately, it's a matter of uh, the work that you do, you know, so um, owners and titles, that's just kind of extra. Because you're a national artist, that mean, doesn't mean you're better than the writer that you are really uh, that you are. Now you kind of, uh, 
I, I suppose it's just uh, it's a matter of whether one is whether you have the time, and second whether it's something that uh, interests interests you. So, uh, so uh, that kind of you have to pace yourself. So, so uh, like over the past several months, kind of uh, you turn down as many as you as you can. But there are invitations also that uh, you you feel uh, you need to accept. So, but. Uh, but uh, prime is whether kind of where it's something that in, that interests you, you know? so uh, uh, so uh, you know if it's uh, so I think primarily whether it's something uh, you can do given the time and uh, what I said earlier yeah, you feel it's kind of kind of uh, also a good uh, learning experience. But uh, otherwise, like, uh, like for instance, but I'm, uh, usually you get invited for like a keynote, keynote. And generally, that's the kind that I don't like. Okay. Okay, keynote, good is more, kind of more like a general one, but was lingaw ng mag, you, you uh, do a research paper on, uh, and it's something more specific than something uh, general. Oh, no, you have to kind of to pick and choose. No, kind of uh, the, the uh, if you're looking for like at least the the, the good thing about the pandemic is that uh, you have lots of time to. And actually, kind of, I'm, as I said, I'm not into uh, gadgets and uh, technical, but uh, I mean, inter the, inter the kind of the internet really is a great thing for We imagine like kind of what it was for scholars before the internet and now. Imagine the advantages that scholars today have, having, having access to uh, all that, uh, all that uh, data. So, uh, kind of, it, it was it was something that kind of uh, uh, I res kind of uh, I resisted for, it. but uh, like with the pandemic, you really kind of uh, since you're spending a lot of time at home, so uh, you kind of uh, spend more time kind of uh, uh, using the using the internet and kind of begin, uh, kind of appreciate the, the fact that there's there's kind of you know you, that's a great advantage for uh, scholars although I don't agree with there are also some people who are so enthusiastic about it that they feel that you can find everything you need there which is not at all true no? so uh, it's not on which is not uh, true and even if you find the materials there you have to pay <laughs> I mean, you don't have access. You, you need to pay for access. So that's a problem. But nevertheless, the amount of material, uh, is, uh, that's really kind of, uh, uh, I mean, you can, you can do a lot with what's, uh, uh, with what's uh, available. And my point is also is that uh, kind of, it's a matter of like kind of, uh, Choosing your subject. I mean, it's it's useful for like uh, scholars to complain that they're not able to do the work because there's no funding. No funding is important, but even without funding, there's there's a lot of work you can you can uh, 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 you can be productive with uh, what with what uh, with what you have. But I, I still have not kind of uh, sold completely to the idea of internet sources. In fact, what I do, and I asked Ambet Ocampo about this once, I said, whether it's okay, like I said, there's a book, for instance, that uh, I've accessed uh, internet. You know? 
Uh, and usually what's available is kind of mga old books, diba? not the visa cards. But if you're interested in like old books, I mean, often there's a good chance it, it will be available. You can, you can download the text there, like 19th century and, uh, and uh, so on. So, so, if I, so I was asking, but if the, the, book, the book there, the, the book is there, and so I cite the book. What I do is I cite the, the book itself. I don't say that I got it from the internet. No? Kind of, also because kind of cumbersome in uh, citation. So, so he said, yeah, that's perfectly all right. So I felt whether it's not kind of cheating. It's almost like by not citing the internet, so you, you have actually consulted the hard copy. But that, you have, the thing is you have the whole book there. You have the whole book there. It's, uh, in, it's uh, a, available in digit, dig, uh, digital form. So why would I kind of not, you know, I mean, I would not, it, because it's always like looks better if you cite the book itself instead of the, in the internet, right? So, uh, so I, I suppose it would, it, uh, there, there will be times when kind of, uh, kind of it probably is a bit dishonest uh, to do it if like, I don't know, perhaps if you don't actually have the whole book available. But the whole book is, you know, that's as good as, as seeing a hard, a hard copy. So they kind of, for young scholars, you know, there's, of course, it depends on kind of the fields and kind of your interest, but uh, there's really no kind of um, excuse for not being uh, not being uh, uh, pro productive. No? Discussing the national artist is actually a joy, especially if you've read a lot of his works. You get into a broader picture of the scope of, you know, and, and the breadth of a great mind. And I enjoyed doing the Resil Moharas Reader, uh, which compiled most of his uh, writings on Cebuano studies. I suppose were it not for the pandemic, we could have more writers talk about their experiences, more scholars talk about uh, their views and um, their admiration for the national artist. So thank you very much for this. Um, opportunity to be able to share about Dr. Resil Mojares. I hope that in the future we get to have more national artists, not only in the field of literature, uh, but also in the field of theater and, of course, music. I'm just thinking off the bat, we have Monsignor Rodolfo Villanueva, who he is also a writer, but at the same time a musician. And we have the late Piyux Kabahar, whose body of work is just spectacular. Uh, the range of his plays, uh, directing the first Cebuano movie, and all of that, that's another subject for you know, a possible national artist. Thank you.